Doesn't work. Now it does. Dave, Dave is the button this, today. This doesn't work. All righty. Um, so we've done uh, two of these already. And today we'll take up the third. And I had a, a question in my mind about where to go with this because uh, philosophy is, uh, wanders all over the map in terms of theme and in terms of uh, the number of philosophers and so forth. And I'm very mindful that um, many of you, probably most of you, are not philosophy majors, not interested in philosophy. What can I give you that would interest you in this subject? So uh, what do I do here? Uh, there we go. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to cover today first. Where we were last time, I'll go over that. Four words that come down to us today from four schools of ancient philosophy. Um, I find it a little bit amusing, and maybe it'll be useful to you. How those words differ from the original philosophies and how much richer those original philosophies were. Uh, two of them are still um, in the news today. And I have a couple of articles here in front of me. The origins of these four schools, um, this will be a partial disc discussion of the origins because the origins go back into the mists of time. You don't really know where ideas begin, but you know when certain themes start to be articulated, if there's a written record. And we're talking about the early period here where the records are very fragmentary in the earliest part, uh, 6th century, 5th century uh, Greece. How these schools of philosophy are still relevant. If they weren't relevant, this would be an antiquarian thing of interest only to a few people who like antique ideas. So if it's not, I have always felt that philosophy has got to be two things. It must be relevant now, and it must have contact with ordinary life. Those are two of my own philosophical principles. And then I'm going to take up the theme of what is philosophy again. And the reason I take this up is not to be repetitive for its own sake, but because philosophy has been trying to define itself from the very beginning. Uh, but at its simplest, philosophy is knowledge. And at a deep level, philosophy is wisdom, the right knowledge, the important knowledge. So why study philosophy? It helps to understand why we are the way we are, not psychologically, but historically. How to better understand our ideas and institutions. We would really, uh, it is not self-evident that we have democracy like we do, that we have the concepts of free freedom that we do, that even the concept of the self is informed by philosophical thought. But the thing is, is it became so um, part of our culture, it fades into the background. When you uh, understand the origins of these ideas, uh, I think you can begin to appreciate that uh, what we take as obvious and for granted today once was a new idea and a very exciting, if not disturbing, idea. And uh, it helps our ability to reason and to discriminate. I don't think you have to be a philosopher to do that, but I think if you do study philosophy, you will be better, and moreover, you'll appreciate that clear reasoning was not always common. Um, the, the, the lecture this morning, what struck me about it, apart from the insights about human psychology, was that his approach is very philosophical, uh, Professor Friedrich's approach. Uh, he was making very fine distinctions and testable distinctions, and this kind of work originally was done primarily by people who are called philosophers. And just to remind you, the word philosophy uh, only became an academic discipline, something off on the side fairly recently. Natural philosophy was the name of science until Wewell in the, in the 19th century. Um, I think it was William Wewell, uh, a British uh, philosopher of science, invented the word science from scienza, the, the Italian word for knowledge. But originally, it was natural philosophy. 
So I'm going to uh, brief. Yes? I'm, I'm booming into it. Is this better? OK. Back row? Enough? OK. So um, don't worry about all the names. Uh, if you need at the end, I'll tell you the four things I think you should take away. But the reason I mention the names is so that I can make distinctions here. So um, uh, Miletus uh, was an area of Ionia, which was Western Turkey. And uh, there were four, three or four uh, what they call the Ionian physicists. Uh, I don't think they're physicists, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But they attempted to explain uh, nature and natural phenomena uh, with uh, natural or physical explanations. So uh, Thales, or Thales uh, was the leader of that group. I'm, not, I'm gonna back up for a second. Uh, he said uh, it, it is water, and what was he doing? He looked at the fact that water took um, four different, or three or four different forms, vapor, liquid, and uh, what's it? What's, solid is ice, yes. So um, modern physics has four states of nature, uh, you know, solid, liquid, gaseous, and plasma, which is what the sun is. Stars are plasmas. He was looking at the states of nature and saying that the states are fundamental. And the others use different uh, things that they saw. But they're, they're basically, it's an attempt by these early uh, physical thinkers to reduce all the blurring complexity of natural phenomena to something simple and understandable. And in the case of the Ionian school, Pythagoras being the founder of that school, um, it was an attempt to uh, reduce it to number. Now, I was thinking about Pythagoras as I was chewing on my sandwich at lunch today. <laughs> I've, never been a, I've never been a Pythagorean, but I'm very impressed that ultimately we got around to um, measuring and uh, looking at uh, phenomena of nature mathematically. And in physics, that is the dominant way of expressing uh, what you see. When we talk in physics, we're basically just speaking very uh, loosely. But physicists have a very precise way, and it's mathematical. But the mathematical statements in physics are relational. I think it's fair to say that Pythagoras looked at the, 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 the mathematical uh, character of reality not as relational as the, the way things react to one another, but as formal or in terms of a, a shape. And he borrowed his, uh, his idea from, uh, the, from music, from the way sound waves relate to one another, so how we have chords and steps in music. But anyway, he's, he's the originator of the idea that the fundamental nature of reality might be mathematical. And then the Eleatic School, Something that's uh, developing very early on in the conversation among the philosophers is, uh, okay, we want fundamental reality, but how do we account for motion? And there was a deep suspicion that the things that change are not fundamental because they're transitory. And what's transitory can't really be real. It's just a, an appearance. There must be something underlying it. And so these uh, Parmenides believed in the one, unchanging, undiv indivisible one, eternal one, Zeno believe, has a lot of paradoxes where he argues like the turtle can never get there because before it has, gets there, it has to go half the distance, and before that, it has to go half that distance and so forth. And there's an infinite number of halves, therefore motion's impossible, despite what you see. Uh, Zeno, <laughs> Zeno's arguments were difficult, but ultimately refuted much, much later. Plato is, a, is an Eleatic, he's a lot of other things, but he also believed in the uh, eternal, indivisible uh, ideas. They are the fundamental reality. The problem, I think, with Plato ultimately is that what he took as ideas are essentially linguistic forms, not objective, uh, mathematically expressible forms, the kinds of forms we see in uh, E equals MC squared or uh, the formula for motion or electricity and so forth. Then the atomist, and uh, one of the atomists will uh, play a part in what today's story. Uh, atomism begins very early with Leucippus and then Democritus and then is uh, 
retold in a long poem by Lucretius, a Roman poet, a very beautiful poem. Uh, Lucretius is really uh, Epicurean. The Epicureans, which we're going to talk about today, uh, were atomists. That's what they took as their physics, the, the model of atoms. So you see, at the very earliest stages, we have mathematics looking for permanence, a material explanation, and uh, atomism uh, as a core thing. And this was with, all without experimentation. These were intuitions that these people had. And I don't think they were physicists, because I take a physicist from the point of view of today as someone who takes these models and is able to test them, and they did not. So I showed you this last time, and I just want to remind you that we're going to talk about influences today. It's awfully complicated, and it's difficult because the degree of influence is often hard to measure. Uh, there's another thing, too, uh, and Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, a very disturbing philosopher to many, but I find him very interesting. He's got a lot of interesting ideas, said all, of bi all philosophy is biography. And what he meant by that is that, by, that the philosopher is always an individual who's working out an issue in his own life or issues in his own life. And when we get to um, Diogenes of Sinope, I think you'll see what I mean. So Socrates, I'm not going to repeat a lot just to mention him, because the four schools of philosophy that I'm going to mention today all have their roots in, in Socrates. But Socrates himself was influenced by the sophists. And the sophists were very controversial. Plato really slammed the sophists. And they were teachers for hire. Well, the, at the time, Platonism was very uh, popular, and Plato's view was dominant. Sophists are shallow philosophers. They don't teach much, and they exploit the youth, demanding payment. And the whole thing is corrupt and worthless. That's kind of how Plato looked at it. But the modern scholarship uh, finds uh, that that view uh, cannot be sustained even in terms of contemporary sources, and I'll explain in a moment, and let alone when you look at how they were treated in Athenian society as a whole. Starting with the last point, Athenian society was an oral society in which um, the uh, men, at least, uh, the free men, were able to uh, govern themselves democratically, at least most of the time. There were tyrants and so forth, but most of the time. And uh, public debate was very important. And public debate depended upon rhetorical skills, which the sophists taught. But they also required some understanding of uh, history, uh, common culture, and politics. So the sophists were providing a needed educational service. Uh, and Plato, I, I think Plato would be right if the sophists claimed more for themselves than what they were doing. But there's not any evidence that that, that they were doing anything more than teaching the, the young men, it was a uh, patriarchal, the young men, the, the skills they needed in order to be effective, free uh, citizens in a democracy. But the other thing that's very interesting is the role that the sophists play in the dialogues of Plato. Now, the dialogues use Socrates as a character, a, a literary character. And in those, Hippias, Gorgias, and Protagoras are all uh, primary characters in dialogues. Those are all three sophists, and they're treated with respect. Those are considered to be early dialogues of Plato. So I think uh, Plato's hostility to the uh, sophists is something that developed, and many people feel that Socrates himself uh, was influenced by their uh, uh, rhetorical ar uh, arguments. So, Socrates said, know yourself. He made no claims to knowledge. He said, I know only that I don't know. That's a famous paraphrase, but very close. I know only that I am ignorant. And yet he thought the only life worth living is the examined life. So he's, he doesn't know anything. He's been looking for a long time. He still doesn't know anything. Um, we'll get back to that toward the end of t today. Can you live not knowing? And then I want to really, uh, if you read anything outside of this class on philosophy, there is a translation of a word, a Greek word, which is very misleading. The word virtue, I think it is fair to say for us in the 21st century, 
suggests um, a moral state. Virtue is being moral, being a good person. The word in Greek was arete, and arete means excellence. Morality is only one form of excellence, the full, reaching the full potential of whatever you are or whatever it is is also erote, and it is used that way by the Greeks. So the, a, a closer, I think more accurate um, use of the word is that he pursued a life of excellence, not a life of virtue. And uh, remember, always to be, I am anyway, cautious about um, equating Socrates with Plato. Socrates wrote nothing, Plato took Socrates as a character, and uh, if you look at the development of ideas in, in Plato's uh, dialogues, he moves from treating Socrates like I think he really originally was, a critical philosopher, criticizing ideas of his society. Plato becomes a system builder, trying to create an alternative view uh, and advance that. So what are these four words? Cynical, stoical, Epicurean and skeptical. He bore his pain stoically. The meal was an Epicurean delight. <laughs> That's kind of, they're chained. <laughs> it's not as they're chained. She listened to his story skeptically. He took a cynical view of the proposal. So the common meeting today, a cynical person is contemptuously distrustful of human nature and motives. No, isn't that what you think usually? That uh, was a cynical thing you just said. Stoical, apparently or professedly indifferent to pleasure or pain. Epicurean, involving an appreciation of food and drink. Skeptical, having an attitude of doubt or disposition to incredulity, either in general or toward a particular object. That's how we think of these words now. But these words grew out of philosophies and only certain aspects of this meaning were those there in the original philosophy. I'm rushing. I've got to slow down. The cynics. So I'm going to back up again as I have with some of the others. I'm now talking about origins of ideas. Xenophanes of Colophon was an early social critic who was critical of the credulous belief in mythological figures. He said if, uh, if uh, ca uh, cows had gods, they would look like cows. Because he was making fun of the uh, Greek uh, portrayal of the gods as having human form. And he also uh, he mocked the Greek valorization of athleticism. And the Greeks did. They, they, thought the Olympic Games were, I hear you, <laughs> were uh, very conformist. But the real or person who, who really started the ball rolling on cynical philosophy was Antisthenes. And Antisthenes uh, was a student of Socrates. Two of these schools that I'm going to mention today began with thinkers who were present at the time Socrates committed suicide uh, by taking hemlock. That was in punishment uh, for his conviction of corrupting the youth of Athens, leading them to impiety. I've read, I think, all of the dialogues now, and uh, I think that is a big stretch of the imagination. Um, if you ever want to get into it, uh, I think Socrates was a victim of a political clash that was going on in Athens, dealing with the Peloponnesian War. He, he was actually a veteran. So today, let's think of uh, Socrates, who fought uh, in the Peloponnesian War on behalf of Athens. Popping? OK. Is that better? Still? No. What? OK. I won't. I'm going to lean on it, though. Lean on it. So remember, Socrates was looking for what, what constitutes the good life. What is a life of excellence? And uh, 
the purpose was to live in virtue, but, but I've, I, I, as I said, that means excellence. In agreement with nature is what Antisthenes said, that the, to realize your potential, you have to be working with nature. It, it makes no sense to work against what you are fundamentally as a human being or for a horse to run, to be, try to be a, an ox. Everything is, reaches its excellence by working with what its fundamental nature is. Happiness can be achieved by rigorous training and by suppression of conventional desires for p wealth, power, sex, and fame, uh, and leading the simple life free of possessions, of all possessions. Socrates himself lived this way. He um, uh, cared very little for his clothing. Uh, the implication was he didn't bathe frequently. And uh, he lived in the street uh, off of the, uh, don't, the, the generosity of his young aristocratic friends. Uh, Socrates never advocated that. He just did it. The Cynics school uh, begins there in the, the fifth century BC and extends to the third century BC and uh, BCE and uh, in Greece and, and pretty much fades out. But then it reappears in first century Rome and its um, teachings and its attitudes can be found among the statements of the early Christian ascetics. So I'm going to spend some time now with uh, this particular cynic who gives the name cynic to the school. He didn't give it. It was actually given to him because cynic comes from the Greek word for dog. It, and we know the joke, <laughs> dog and God, spelled backwards. Uh, that's a mere coincidence of English. <laughs> but his name, Diogenes, means comes from God. And he was known by um, the better, the, better the, the aristocrats of uh, Corinth as a dog, and maybe also the aristocrats of Athens. He was in both Athens and Corinth. Why was he known as a dog? It was because of the way he lived. If Socrates was neglect, neglectful of his uh, appearance and his cleanliness, uh, Diogenes celebrated it and made a point of it. He was trying, he was countercultural. He was trying to uh, get Corinthians and uh, Athenians to question their conformity, to, con to question their conventions, to, to look at the shallowness and hypocrisy of the way they lived. So what is his background? His father was a banker in um, Sinope. Sinope is a, an, a Greek town, or was a Greek town, on the Black Sea uh, in what was called Ionia. And uh, his father minted coins, a banker who minted coins. And uh, Diogenes was apprenticed to his father and was going to become a banker. But he was punished by exile when he debased the currency uh, it said debased in my article, but in another article, it referred to defacing. You debase the currency by defacing it because they imprinted it with symbols of gods or political leaders. And why, do, why did that occur? Well, one take on it is that he became countercultural very early and uh, was basically making fun of his father's uh, materialistic life. However, archaeologists have gone into Sinope and found many coins which were defaced. <clears throat> and, that's, and the reason why they were defaced is that the, um, uh, the mixture of silver to other metals and the coins indicates that the coinage was counterfeit. So, and these coins come from approximately the same period. So there's, a, there's an indication <clears throat> <clears throat> that they had a political problem, an economic and a political problem, and it might well have been that Diogenes was exiled for debasing the coinage 
by those people who wanted the system to keep going the way it was, making money off of counterfeit money, counterfeit coins. In any, any case, he was uh, kicked out. The, the story he gave is that he went to the oracle seeking advice and that the oracle commanded him to debase the currency. Well, the advice he may have been seeking is, what do I do? My father's circulating coinage, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's counterfeit. We don't know. Although he, uh, he, he went to Athens then and became the so-called faithful hound. This was a term that was used about him. Even before he was called a dog, he was called the faithful hound of Antisthenes, and that's why I mentioned Antisthenes. And Antisthenes was also asking people to not uh, value the conventions of wealth and power and luxury, uh, but to live a, a deeper, more uh, ethical life. Um, but uh, ultimately, he left Athens. Uh, he was, uh, as many people were, it's an, uh, uh, if you go back into ancient history, many people are uh, uh, in shipwrecks, and he was in a shipwreck, and he was washed up on a shore and captured uh, by pirates and sold into slavery. And uh, when he was asked his trade, he said, <laughs> I know no trade but that of governing men. I wish to be sold to a man who needs a master. <laughs> this was a pun in Greek. Because in, in the ancient Greek language, the words governing men are homophonic with the words teaching values to people. So he was making a little joke. The Corinthian liked Diogenes and hired him to be the tutor of his two sons. And he spent the rest of his life in Corinth um, uh, teaching virtuous self-control to Corinthians, or tempting to, I guess. <clears throat> well, how did he do that? He went around in, uh, in rags. Uh, he uh, had no living. He ate uh, food that was uh, thrown onto the f ground. And uh, in every way that you can imagine, was a contemptible and provocative person. When asked where he was from, he would often say, I am a citizen of the world, hence the word cosmopolitan cosmopolitan. The world is your city. He carried a lamp around. You've probably heard this story around with him all the time. And when asked why he was doing it, he said, I'm searching for an honest man. So this is the time of uh, Philip of Macedon and Alexander the Great. And Philip, it was heard uh, by the Corinthians that Philip of Macedon, who was a very powerful uh, king, uh, of uh, Macedon, an area north of Corinth. Uh, he, he was coming to town. In fact, he con ultimately conquered all of uh, Greece, of Peloponnese. He conquered it. So may maybe they, want, they were afraid of him as well as wanted to impress him. But they started cleaning up their city, plastering, whitewashing, and everything. And uh, uh, what did Diogenes do? He took his tub. He slept in a tub, a, a large vat, a uh, ceramic vat. And uh, he took his tub and started rolling it around, and they asked him what he was doing. And he said, uh, uh, I do not want to be thought the only idler in such a busy multitude, so I'm, I'm rolling my tub to be like the rest. <laughs> you can see he was winning friends and influencing people. Maybe, maybe not. He reminds me of a yippie. Do you remember the yippies? They had a brief period of infamy in America. Uh, Youth International Party, they would do similar things. They're always thumbing their nose at conventional society. Alexander the Great came and greeted uh, Diogenes saying, I am Alexander the Great King. I can imagine Alexander saying that. Diogenes replied, I am Diogenes the dog. Thrilled at having met the famous Diogenes, Alexander asked if he might do Diogenes a favor. Diogenes said, stand out of my sunlight. I will show you a painting, a, a reproduction of a painting in a moment. When Del Alexander declared to Diogenes, if I were not Alexander, then I should wish to be Di Diogenes. Do you know what he said? You can imagine. 
If I were not Alexander, I would still wish to be Diogenes. In another account, Alexander found Diogenes looking at a pile of human bones and asked him why. Diogenes explained, I am searching for the bones of your father, but cannot distinguish them from a slave. Now, that's insulting, of course, and provocative, but isn't there something deeper there? When you're dead, there really is no difference between the bones of a slave and the bones of a king. When Plato, when Plato, who was still alive at that time, defined man as a featherless biped, that's a famous expression, man as the featherless biped, what did Diogenes do? He plucked a chicken and brought it to the academy, saying, here, I brought you a man. Thereafter, the academy changed the definition, saying it's a featherless biped with broad nails. When asked what, he should be done, what should be done with his body, he, when he died, he said, toss it over the city walls to be eaten by wild animals. Won't you mind this, he was asked? Not at all, so long as you give me a stick to chase the creatures away. And then they, they said, chase them away? How can you use the stick if you're not aware? And he replied, of course, how can I mind being eaten if I'm not aware? And Diogenes' example and teachings ultimately led to Stoicism, but before I want to go on with that, I just want to sum up and say the reason I spent so, so much time uh, talking about Diogenes is that Diogenes um, sought only virtue better revealed in actions than theory. He was always trying to demonstrate by his behavior what, Athenia what Th Athenians and later Corinthians should be doing in his mind, which is to be questioning, asking why they believe the way they believe and what they do, and, and to be uh, more self-critical. Because he is a post-Socratic. The unexamined life is not worth living, and uh, we should know ourselves. There is the Greek word for you, kinikos, dog-like. So here is a uh, 19th century uh, painting showing Diogenes and his, and I'm sure that it wasn't nearly as beautiful as uh, you see here. He's in the shade with his, uh, uh, his tub. And here's another painting in the 17th century uh, by Gaspar de Crayer. And there's uh, Alexander standing over him in what looks like uh, probably Roman. <laughs> they did not know very well what uh, Greek armor looked like. Roman armor uh, standing over Diogenes blocking the sunlight. Stoicism. Remember a Stoic, to bear pain with a outreaction Stoicism was a, a way of life. It was not just a, a, a set of ideas. Virtue was considered to be the only good, but again, the word virtue should be viewed in terms of living to your full potential, ver uh, excellence. And it was a, considered to be a path to happiness. Virtue is living rationally with nature. Remember Antisthenes, that idea, living ra rationally with nature. But to live with nature, you must understand nature. And nature for a Stoic, or God, another word they used interchangeably, is passive matter that is activated by divine reason, or logos. And we share in that logos. But to understand the logos, we need to possess clear and unbiased reason. Oh, wait a second. What we were talking about this morning. Certain emotions cause us uh, error in judgment, so we need self-control. Suffering ends by accepting with equanimity what is beyond our control. This is a uh, Buddhist concept. External things, health, wealth, pleasure, are not goods, but material for virtue. In other words, they're not good in themselves. They're only good when used 
well. The best sign of one's philosophy is behavior, not words. Another borrowing from um, cynicism. So the founder of Stoicism was Zeno of Citium. And uh, that's the place, uh, uh, Citium is a place where its founder was has, uh, stought, taught in the Stoa Poca, Poicoli, Poicoli. The Stoa Poicoli was a colonnade decorated with mythological and uh, battle scenes, a public place on the north side of the Agora in Athens. I hope some of you have gone to Athens, and I hope more of you will, uh, but it's nice to be able to walk where these great people did walk, and the Agora is still there, um, though it's uh, down to its nub right now. Originally, this philosophy was called, after its uh, founder, Xenonism, but the name was dropped because the Stoics did not believe their founders were perfectly wise and did not want their philosophy to become a cult of personality. Stoicism differed from cynicism in not making a display of poverty and ostentatious mocking of conventional lifestyles and values. In other words, Stoicism was more reserved and I would say more directed inwardly toward the um, improvement of oneself as opposed to the improvement of society. In the cynical approach to philosophy, it's in your face and it's trying to change everyone else uh, at the same time of, um, that the cynic is living out the cynic philosophy. But the Stoics uh, were more dignified. They sought to be above the fray, seeking peace by using reason to clearly see the world as it is, seeking self-control of their, their own individual passions and letting go of what was beyond their control. There's a well-known uh, quotation that comes from the Enchiridion by Epictetus, one of the Stoics lift, listed up there. It's not the events that upset us, but our judgments about the events. We know that, don't we? It's become part of our common knowledge. Many self-help uh, philosophies that are in, uh, around us today uh, uh, teach us this lesson. The Stoic Cleanthes once said, the wicked man is like a dog tied to a cart and compelled, compelled to go wherever the cart goes. A Stoic, by contrast, will amend his will to suit the world, which was the divine logos, and remain, as Epictetus later put it, sick yet happy, sick physically yet happy, in peril and yet happy, dying and yet happy, in exile and happy, in disgrace and happy, and what does he mean by that? Not fighting what you cannot change. Happiness comes from acceptance of what cannot be altered. And it, this resembles Buddhism very much. Stoics uh, propounded that knowledge can be obtained by reason. Truth can be distinguished from fallacy. Even if in practice only an approximation to truth or fallacy can be made. Sensations create impressions. The mind has the ability to judge, approve, or disprove an impression. Hesitant approval is mere belief, which in Greek is doxa. Doxology comes from that. Some of you are Catholics or Episcopalians, you know the doxology. Through reason we reach clear comprehension and conviction, catalepsis in Greek. Certain and true knowledge, which is episteme, episteme, epistemology, is achievable by the Stoic sage and can be attained only by verifying the conviction with the expertise of one's peers and the collective judgment of humankind. This reminds me, uh, so in other words, the Stoics uh, did not believe that you could necessarily come to truth on your own. It required ability, that's the Stoic sage, and you should confer with your peers and uh, ultimately uh, the collective judgment of humankind. So they were, they were, you might say, moderate or modest in their claims to knowledge. They developed a logic, still a problem, uh, propositional logic. And propositional logic is like uh, this. Uh, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Socrates is, therefore, Socrates is mortal. This begins with the, um, the Stoics. 
and also Aristotle. But uh, Aristotle uh, and Stoicism, uh, Stoicism overlaps Aristotle. Stoicism, Stoicism became the most popular philosophy among the educated elites of Hellenistic uh, Greece and Rome. And look up there at the famous people who have been Stoics in the years since. Uh, Epictetus himself is famous. Seneca the Younger, very famous if you have a classical education. The Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who wrote the Meditations. Michel de Montaigne, the Essays, the inventor of the Essay. And today, Massimo, uh, P I don't know how to pronounce it in Italian, but Pigliucci? Pigliucci? How to, and I was going to bring a book today to show you another one that's uh, 365 days of Stoic sayings. You can't actually go through the calendar and be uh, reflecting on these Stoical expressions. So there is a picture of him. And that's a Roman bust. If you, I thought about bringing uh, a lot of pictures of these uh, ancient Greek philosophers and putting them on the screen. Almost none of them are reliable uh, because almost uh, none of them come from the period and uh, there were no photographs. So we don't, unless they, we know it was from a copy of the period, we, there's little chance that the image corresponds with what, what uh, you see. The, the uh, bust of uh, Socrates, which I didn't bring, uh, pro could have been like Socrates because it's a, a fat, ugly guy, <laughs> which is what Socrates was described as being. But I will stop there a little bit early, but uh, stop there and uh, invite you to ask questions or to comment. The thing I want to say as you're getting the mics out is that uh, each of these four philosophies were an attempt to take up the um, mantle from uh, Socrates and look for improving life. I've talked about this uh, series of talks in terms of turning points in philosophy. The turns of these four are rather small turns, but they had lasting effects. Uh, what's going on? Okay. So to me, Stoicism sounds uh, very modern, and um, yet, um, w where is the Stoic part of that? The, which what sounds very modern? Stoicism, S T O I C I S M. Stoicism, to reduce it to uh, a sound bite, is uh, a philosophy based upon uh, knowing ra rationally, discerning what is. Uh, nature, what is the, the logic of the situation, and adapting to it so that you'll have peace of mind or tranquility. There doesn't seem to be any connection between that and the meaning of the word. No, well, bear, bearing um, uh, uh, pain and suffering and anxiety with equanimity and death with equanimity, uh, consider the way Socrates died. Uh, his Follow the people that were around him. He's not a Stoic, but he's a precursor. Uh, he took. He, he was prepared for death. He accepted it. It was, in fact, he accepted the choice. He could have gone on to, to exile. He accepted the punishment uh, with equanimity, and that is a Stoic response. That's what we think of as Stoicism today, bearing uh, painful, hard, hard things equi with equanimity because you rationally see and accept it cannot be otherwise. Uh, hi, Bob. This is Don. I, d I just wanted to uh, mention your uh, comment about hope you get a chance to go to Athens or go to Greece and see some of these things. I had the uh, opportunity to do a, a three-week seminar on the history or the golden age of Greek mathematics in in Athens, a and we did exactly that. We said, why not go to Samos for the weekend and and so uh, uh, we did, and and you know there are lots of there are lots of uh, 
what I want to say. Uh, there's the Pythagorean motel with a big right triangle sign <laughs> and you know also all, so, all sorts of monuments but the more interesting thing we found there was just out driving in the countryside in Samos and and saw a sign that indicated it was Pythagoras's cave and of course the legend has that when some of his ideas got a little out of mainstream he had to escape the the, the masses well I, I don't know if this was actually a cave or not but quite clearly it was a cave it had any pagan symbols painted over and, and replaced with more up-to-date symbols. So that was very interesting. We then decided why not go to uh, Miletus and see if there was any, any uh, uh, which was, of course, a cross in Turkey. what's now Turkey, yeah. uh, and, and uh, go to the ancient, the ancient uh, what do I want to say? Uh, great, a, a large auditorium outside. What's oh, amphitheater? Called? Yes, a, a <laughs> amphitheater of um, Melita. So anyway, I, I found that helped, uh, e even though we didn't know what they, the, the people looked like. I, I think it helped kind of make it real uh, by just occupying those spaces. Yeah, we're not covering uh, Pythagoras. I have in the go through philosophy. You've got to make choices. Uh, Pythagoras, uh, his school of philosophy was um, as just as much a religion as it was a philosophy. It was uh, very um, mystical in its beliefs. And uh, we don't know a lot about the details because of it came down to us through later thinkers and writers. Thank you for doing this, Bob. I appreciate it very much. Despite the fact that I had a technical uh, education, I've always been interested in history. And when I see something like this, I try to connect it with what actually happened in history. And to me, it looks like these people were, they must have been ignored by almost everybody who, about the time, and followed them, if you think about the wars that have been fought. They they had notoriety, and I th I really think uh, some of these people, like uh, Diogenes of Sinope, that they attracted crowds. People came to them like they would come to a circus to see what was going on. They didn't want to socialize with them, but they had heard about them and they wanted to see them. Yeah, hi, oh. Karen. Um, so you just mentioned that it did border on the a religious thought. Pythagoras, yes. Uh, so, did the Eastern Buddhism and Hinduism come from this, or are, were they independently developed? Uh, there is a book, I wish I had brought the title for you, but I can bring it uh, next time. There is a big fat book on the subject, and I haven't read it, but I, I, uh, I have it on my uh, laptop. I've read in it, but not read through it. Um, there's a lot of scholarship going on right now. Now, with respect to uh, these ideas that we just talked about, um, I'm trying to remember which one it was, and I believe um, one, of, one of these philosophers went to India with Alexander the Great, and Buddha was 600 BC. So the, the ideas in this case flow the other way, from India back to Greece. And there was a lot of interchange going back and forth uh, between once uh, 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 Alexander the Great uh, conquered Western India, there was a lot of uh, communication, I'm, I'm sure, through the Greek channels back to the West. And I think uh, the Indian civilization, uh, civilizations, because it wasn't one thing either, uh, had a lot of influence on Western thought, but we don't know to what extent yet. Now, um, I want to follow up on David's question, which um, my question is, how did these four groups relate to the current, then current religion, actually religion, their pantheon of gods or however, were they seen as outside of that or within it, or these groups were small enough that they weren't seen as radicals in some way? I mean, what was that relationship? 
Well, I, the first, first of all, it's very complicated, and I hear I'll just start down the road a little bit. And uh, there was no state religion, and there was no orthodoxy. Uh, there were, uh, because of the tribal origins of Greek civilization, they had things in common. But in general, uh, the house god concept was dominant. Athens is named after Athena. Athena is the city god. Each of these cities had their primary gods. Individuals focused on the gods that meant the most to them. And, but nevertheless, when you get these materialistic philosophers coming in, uh, they can be very upsetting because they're mocking convention, they're mocking propriety, what people accepted as uh, proper conduct, proper belief. And when it was associated as it was in the case of Socrates with political issues, they often were in trouble. Uh, we don't know the story of Diogenes Sinope enough to know, but uh, I, I suspect that that was a mixture of political and religious issues too. Um, it's, it's a mixed bag, but the, the main thing is don't look at this in terms of state religion or orthodoxy, but how radical can you be and, and not upset the apple cart? Because some of these were chased out of town, exiled. Even Plato was exiled. Socrates was condemned to death. Plato accepted exile. A whole bunch of these philosophers are exiled at one point or another because they're upsetting to people. Hello, Bob. Uh, uh, George Atkins back here. I see you. Uh, with respect to what we learned this morning and that topic of bias, in your readings uh, and understanding of these philosophers, do you get any sense at all of any of them kind of being aware or approaching that topic? Yes, and in the second hour, when we get into the uh, skeptics, uh, bias is a very big issue for them. And uh, they, they developed skepticism, as, I, as you will see, as a um, habitual pattern of thought. In other words, they got into, I will not believe anything. I will use... I will, uh, I will develop, list, and, and cultivate arguments which prevent me from being overcommitted to any dogma. You'll see this. I'll get into it in more detail. Looks like maybe it's break time then. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a, a story that I skipped over, but I'll, I'll start off by mentioning... Um, Zeno of Citium, the founder of uh, the Stoics. Um, he was on a voyage from Phoenicia to Piraeus, which is the port city of Athens. You, if you've been there, you know that. And he survived a shipwreck. I told you there were shipwrecks all over the place. This is two shipwrecks with two philosophers, uh, Diogenes and, uh, and, uh, and of course, St. Paul was in a shipwreck. Um, he, encountered there, he, 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 he was a shipwreck and wound up in Athens and he was in a bookstore or whatever they called them back then. Probably wasn't called a bookstore, but manuscripts. And he encountered uh, Xenophon's m memorabilia. And Xenophon's memorabilia is a, a uh, Xenophon was a student of Socrates and had written a story about Socrates. And uh, Zeno who was not a philosopher, but he liked the story. And he said, where, where can people like Socrates be found? And as, uh, as that question was being asked, according to the story, the bookseller points out the door and he says, there. And going past him was um, Crates of Thebes, another philosopher, the foremost cynic. I so, told you that Stoicism grows out of cynicism. So he became a follower of uh, Crates. And, uh, and that's how... It physically happened. He literally was an, it was an accident. He read a book. The cynic is walking by. Oh, I'm going to follow that guy. He starts studying with him, and then he develops his own philosophy. Um, so I, I, when I'm dealing with these, I sometimes I find it hard to put approach them the same way, and I think uh, I'm going to use the word keys to Epicureanism. Epicureanism does not mean in that time uh, eating fine food and wine. Oh, wait a second. Pleasure is the chief good of life. 
but it's not prodigal or sensual pleasure. Well, whoever said eating good food was prodigal or wine? To obtain pleasure is to live moderately, to avoid overindulgence. Remember the middle, the middle path, the middle way was considered the path of wisdom in Greek philosophy. To gain knowledge of the workings of the world, this is like Stoicism. Reason according to nature or the logos, the divine order or, uh, of reality. To limit one's desires. The pursuit of tranquility is the real nature of happiness, according to Epicureans. And that is tranquility or ataraxia. And ataraxia is realized if we are free of the fear of death and we're uh, not uh, experiencing bodily pain, aporia or aporia. The Epicureans placed uh, an emphasis on the pleasures of the mind and on friendship. Epicurus, who is the movement is named after the philosopher Epicurus, not Ep Epictetus, that's another guy, <laughs> Epicurus. You don't have to know these guys' names, just the four words, remember those four words. He laid a great emphasis on developing friendships as the ba basis of satisfying life. Cicero quotes, Cicero, the famous Roman orator, quotes um, Epicurus as follows. Of all the things which wisdom has contrived to contribute to a blessed life, none is more important, more fruitful than friendship. While the pursuit of pleasure formed the focal point of philosophy, this was largely directed to minimizing pain, anxiety, and suffering. In fact, Epicurus, Epicurus referred to life, life itself as a bitter gift. So his point of view, his starting point is, life is a mixed blessing. It has a lot of pain. And like, the, like Buddha did with respect to uh, the suffering in the world that he saw, Epicurus saw life is hard. How do we minimize our suffering? And that's more the emphasis than a life of uh, luxurious, abundant pleasure. When we say that pleasure is the end and aim, we do not mean pleasure of the prodigal or the pleasures of sensuality, as we are understood to do by some through ignorance. In other words, even then they misunderstood him. Through ignorance, prejudice, or willful misrepresentation. By pleasure, we mean the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul. It is not by an unbroken succession of drinking bouts and revelry, not by sexual lust, nor the enjoyment of fish and other delicacies of a luxurious table, which produces a pleasant life. It is sober reasoning, searching out the grounds of every choice and avoidance and a banishing those beliefs through which the greatest tumults that take possession of the soul. That is true Epicureanism. You see how different it is from the meaning that it has today. Be moderate, be reasonable, understand the causes of your suffering. So unnecessary and artificial desires are to be repressed. Epicurus uh, actively recommended against passionate love and believed it best to avoid marriage altogether. He and, he and I part ways on that issue. I think it's one of the most wonderful things of life. He viewed recreational sex as natural, but not, ne but not, necessary, uh, but not necessary, and the desire should generally be avoided. Epicureanism divided pleasure into two broad categories pleasures of the body and pleasures of the mind. Pleasures of the body, these pleasures involve sensations of the body, such as the act of eating delicious food and of being in a state of comfort free, free from pain, and exist only as a person is experiencing them, so they're transitory. Pleasures of the mind involve mental processes and states. Feelings of joy, the lack of fear, pleasant memories are all examples. These pleasures of the mind exist in the present, but also in the past and in the future. Since memory of, the, uh, of a past pleasant experience or the expectation of some potentially pleasing future can be both pleasurable experiences. They can also be uh, regret in the past or fear of the future. Anyway, 
Because of this, the pleasures of the mind are considered to be greater than those of the body. The, Epic the Epicureans further divided each of these types of pleasures into two categories, kinetic pleasure, uh, I'm not gonna pronounce this for you, uh, the other kind, <laughs> catastomatic, catastomatic. That'll be on the test. <laughs> kinetic pleasure is the, the, the physical or mental pleasures involved in action or change, eating delicious food, as well as fulfilling desires and removing pain, which is itself considered a pleasurable act. And these are all examples of kinetic pleasure. In other words, there's motion involved in them. A charismatic pleasure is one which uh, one feels with, when not being, it's a pleasure one feels while in being without pain. So it doesn't require any change, it's just being with, it's static. The Epicureans were, uh, had, a, uh, had a physics and uh, an epistemology. F the epistemology is the theory of knowledge. The physics was materialistic. The universe is filled with atoms. They were influenced by Democritus. All atoms are uh, uh, in motion, uh, and there's no motion without a void. In fact, let me, uh, let me uh, go through this in just a moment. And there's a finite number of a types of atoms, but an infinite number of atoms, finite number of types, infinite number. And because there's an infinite number of atoms in an infinite space, an infinite void, there's an infinite number of worlds or cosmoi. The way things form into solid objects is but the atoms swerve randomly and connect. I never got, I read uh, Leucippus, uh, De Rerum Natura, where all this comes from. And uh, the, the connection is that they, there was a positing that the atoms had little hooks on it. I don't know how they knew that. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I don't think that's it. But there is a, uh, an electromagnetic connection uh, Epistemology was empirical, it was based on sensations. They're the first and main criterion of truth. Throughout the history of philosophy, there is always a uh, tug of war going on between where does uh, truth come from? Where does true understanding come from? Is it primarily based on observation or is it based on logic? Well, I think what we have today is a synthesis of that. We look, but we also use logic. If sensations mislead, remember when the stick is stuck into the water partially, it looks bent? Are you being deluded by the stick? Or are you be being deluded by your judgment about the stick? Because the correct judgment is not that the stick is bent, rather, it, the stick appears bent. That's a true statement. To go from the stick appears bent to the stick itself is bent, is to go into judgment. So that's what, this is the kind of distinction that uh, Epicureans noted. So Aristippus of Cyrene um, was a pupil of Socrates. I told you there were two present at his death, and this was the other one. Um, he was with him when uh, Socrates took him hemlock. He taught uh, radical hedonism. This is not a Epicurean. Epicureans talk about restraint, but, but he did say that the life of pleasure was the ultimate purpose of life. Live for pleasure wherever you can find it. Carpe diem. Epicurus was a true Epicurean. He's a founder. Pyrrho, after Aristotle over there, Pyrrho we'll get into is the father of skepticism. So skepticism also had an influence. He turned against Platonism. Why would he turn against Platonism? Because Plato had all these theories which were not necessarily evident by the senses. Plato actually in the uh, di diagram, if you can see Plato's diagram of uh, knowledge, 
places uh, sensory knowledge below the line and rational knowledge above the line, and rational knowledge is purer and, and truer than uh, uh, sensation. So Epicureanism was rediscovered in the 18th century by the philosophes like Voltaire and Montesquieu. And they had a politics. Uh, the uh, Socrates actually was part of the government, uh, the 400 or 500, I forgot which number that was, but the, the governing body of Athens for a while. Uh, they advocated avoiding politics because it causes disturbance, and emotional disturbance leads to unhappiness. You get caught up in the, the lust for fire, the lust for, for power. You get caught up in your vanity. So the Epicureans would uh, advocate you stay away from that. But interestingly, they viewed every, no one was inherently, because they were materialists, they didn't believe there was any uh, justification for believing that any human being was uh, any more superior than any other fundamentally. Behavior might be better or worse, but the, the human itself was just another organism. So I'm gonna read a few things here from you before going on, and that again is a uh, bust of Epicurus. This, this is to remind you to keep these two separate. The Epicurean restaurant in California is not the, named after this guy. <laughs> um, Aristippus was shipwrecked, cast ashore on the coast, uh, saw geometrical figures drawn on the rocks. He cried out to his companions, let us be of good cheer for I see traces of man. With that he made for the city of Rhodes and went straight to the gymnasium. There he fell to discussing philosophical subjects and, and presents were given to him. So he could not only fit himself out but could also provide those who accompanied him with clothing and all the necessities of life. When his companions wished to return to their country and ask him what message he wished to carry, them to carry home, he bade them say this, that children ought to be provided with property and resources of the kind that could swim, swim with them, even out of a shipwreck. Such anecdotes do not suggest a person who was a mere slave of his passions, because he found something to be glad about wherever he went and whatever happened. Rather, uh, he, took, uh, it was, uh, he was one who took a pride of exacting enjoyment for all the circumstances of every kind. This illustrates and confirms the two statements of Horace, the Roman uh, poet, Horace. To observe the precepts of Aristippus, Aristippus is, quote, to endeavor to adapt circumstances to myself, not myself to circumstances, and that, quote, in every, in every complexion of life, every station and circumstance sat gracefully upon him. He was adjusted to whatever happened. We learn from Epicurus, from, from, that is uh, in the uh, book by uh, Diogenes Laertius, Laertius, The Lives and Opinions of Famous Philosophers, uh, that the, um, about, about all of these philosophers. Epicurus was born on the Greek island of Samos, Don. Epicurus was born there, okay. To Athenian parents, influenced by Democritus, Aristotle, and Pyrrho, as, I, as you saw. Over half of the uh, doctrines of Epicureanism are direct contradictions of Platonism. He was very hostile to Plato's approach to philosophy. So let's now go to the, the next one, the skeptics. Now these philosophers, uh, eventually, all of them are in place. They have competing schools. The schools are not formal schools. They're not state run. They're not funded by government. They're funded by donations. The property that uh, 
Plato taught in uh, and uh, was known later as the Acad Academy uh, is named after the person named Academus. So the word ac academy that comes down to us today as a place of learning was originally the, f the uh, personal name of the owner of that property. This also is a philosophical tradition and it refers to uh, specific schools of thought. The tradition of skepticism goes back to Socrates. In fact, it goes back to Xenophon. It goes back to any philosopher who's questioning conventional knowledge. That's skepticism. But it became a, a formal school of philosophy with a set of beliefs. Xenophanes, as I told you, uh, satirized conventional beliefs. The sophists were, uh, uh, used skeptical argumentation as a way of uh, tearing down and attacking an opponent's point of view. And when that's applied to serious subjects in philosophy, it becomes a useful tool, and that's what Socrates himself did. Oh, you say that freedom consists of this. Well, how do you define freedom? And the definition is provided. Well, if it has that definition, how do you account for this? And the reason is given. Okay, if that's true, then how do you account for that? And by this process of going back and forth, this dialogic process, the definition is shown to be weak, or even better, a better definition emerges. That's the Olinkus. Pyrrho of Elis was the founder of Pyrrhonism, which is the name of uh, one strand of, the, of skepticism. Eventually, uh, skepticism developed into a dogmatic school, but skepticism in its core belief is completely anti-dogmatic. So what, what, what happened here, I will summarize for you and when, then we'll get into this baby steps. The skeptics developed a series of arguments that established that, no, that true knowledge is impossible, that we can never be certain of anything. Some skeptics, the academics, who were Platonist, Plato's school, came to believe those arguments provided conv convincing and ir irrefutable proof that knowledge is impossible. But the original school didn't do that. They didn't say that knowledge was impossible. They simply said, I am unable to know based on these arguments. There's a big gap between those two. I am unable to know because of these arguments does not necessarily lead to the conclusion that knowledge itself is impossible. So that split remained in philosophy from that point on. We know most about skepticism through this writer who is a Roman skeptic, Sextus Empiricus, who wrote the outlines of Pyrrhonism. Before I go any further, I wanna say, how did I come across skepticism? Well, I was taking a course in uh, Descartes, the, the father of modern philosophy, a materialist uh, and, uh, who believed in geometrical uh, approaches to the understanding of the nature and mathematical approaches. And uh, he wanted to find a fundamental knowledge. He wanted, so you wind up with a cogito ergo sum. I, I believe, uh, I know therefore I believe, uh, see, I think therefore I know. Cogito, er, I think therefore I am, I'm sorry. I think therefore I am. And uh, why was he focused on that? It turns out that uh, he had read uh, Sextus Empiricus, like many other um, uh, early modern philosophers, uh, Pierre Bale, ba Bale um, uh, Pascal, Blaise Blas Pascal, and others, and they were shaken to their foundations by the arguments that Sextus Empiricus uh, had, had advanced for the impossibility of knowledge. And he, didn't, he wanted to advance science, and he wanted to get past the um, skepticism of the, 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 this school of philosophy. So he was arguing against Pyrrhonism and uh, thought that he had found the, the answer to it in the Cochijo, uh, ergo sum. Well, Pyrrho was, uh, was from, the, uh, from Ellis and uh, he practiced uh, uh, the art of painting when he was young, uh, but became a philosopher. He studied the writings of Democritus and became a disciple of uh, two other philosophers we won't talk about, and I will not name, you don't need to know them. He took part in, an, this is the Indian expedition, I couldn't remember who that was, 
It was Pyrrho who went to India with Alexander the Great. And he came back uh, with who knows what. I think not with atomism because Democritus had already uh, developed that. In fact, before him, um, Leucippus. But uh, he came back. And uh, in Greece, he was frustrated by the assertions of the dogmatists, including people like uh, Plato and his followers. Uh, they complained to possess knowledge and founded a new, he, he, uh, he founded a new school that taught fallibilism. That term is still used uh, in philosophy. And fallibilism is that every object of human knowledge involves uncertainty. So uh, Pyrrho argued that it's impossible to ever arrive at knowledge of the truth. However, philosophical skepticism is not primarily an attitude of knowledge, but a means for finding inner peace. This is the, one of the, the big misunderstandings of skepticism. They, the emphasis has always been placed since the original school on what skepticism says about the possibility of knowledge. But the skeptics themselves, like the Epicureans uh, and uh, the Stoics, were trying to find peace, happiness. The skeptical arguments, as I hinted, to, uh, hinted earlier, uh, became so powerful that some skeptics became dogmatists and asserted that knowledge was impossible. But the original skeptics were looking for inner peace. By the way, St. Augustine wrote against the academics, and that's uh, those academics are academic skepticism from the academy, the, the, the Platonists, who had become skeptical in dogma, asserting the impossibility of certain knowledge. He did that in order to uh, support the possibility of knowledge of uh, God. So happiness, eudaimonia, requires answers to three questions. What's the, practical, uh, what's the nature of practical matters like ethics, affairs, topics? What attitude should we adopt toward them? What will be the result if such attitudes are ad uh, adopted? And the answer is practical matters are logically alike. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean much to me, but I'm giving you the outline that I was following. But as we go through this, it will become clearer, I promise you. Um, these practical matters basically all have to do with what's going on in the world around us. Since perceptions and beliefs neither tell us the truth nor lie, they're unreliable. They, so they take the middle ground. Uh, the Epicurean said, no, no, no. Uh, since perceptions are, are right, but our judgments are sometimes wrong about it. Thus, we should be unwavering and not taking sides about various views. They're not prone to disbelief in the modern sense. They seek peace of mind, ataraxia, through suspension of judgment, epoche, about doctrines of the ultimate nature of things. No one observes causality. Have you ever stopped to think about that? You, you observe a succession of things. Say you're at a, a, a pool table. This is a classic example of a situation where causality should be observed. But you really only see succession one ball approaches and then touches another ball and the other ball goes on. And you call that causation because every time you've ever done it, that's what happened. One ball approached and touched another and another one left. And moreover, you've noticed that the angle seems to make a difference, the angle of incidence where one ball touches another. But you actually don't observe the causality without the objects. So causality is not directly observable. It's inferred from two other things which are observable. And that's what he's really getting at. The external world, that's the world outside of your brain, you never directly experience. You don't experience it even through your eyes. There's no little self in the back of your head here looking through your eyes at the world. No, your cornea admits the light and the uh, back of your eye, not the iris, the retina receives the stimulation, sends a, a stimulus, uh, uh, electrochemical stimulus up into the brain. It gets uh, processed there by various areas in the air brain and an image forms in your mind, which is a hologram of your brain. I, I really do think about the mind as holographic. It's created by the brain to create 
the world that you see outside of your ultimate purpose, God, the soul, those are inferences from things. So they're not logically necessary. Dogmatic faith and intelligible realities like natural law, God, and soul for these skeptics it, it differs from practical assumptions made for the purpose of experience, experiment. So what, he's, what a skeptic is saying there is that, okay, I will assume there is a physical world, I will assume that there are natural laws, and I will make experiments based upon those assumptions. That's the practical part. Assuming things for the sake of practice, assuming things like I'm assuming that bridge is really solid and will not break when I take my car over. Okay, you may not think of it as an experiment, but sometimes the bridge does collapse. It does. It happened in Minnesota a few years ago. Um, so Laertes, in his book on the philosophers, said that these are the 10 uh, modes of reasoning. I'm not going to go through them all there. But all of this is a, are forms of relativism. So from, the, from a skeptic's point of view, because there is no neutral vantage point from which you can judge these things. There's no, you cannot say one thing is absolutely true. Different cultures have this view or that view. Your, your own judgments about what you're seeing in the world depend upon your senses. One sense gives you one uh, idea about what's going on in reality. Another sense gives you another one. Uh, the uh, color assumes uh, changes, uh, uh, ch changes its aspect to you depending upon what other colors are beside it how much shadow is placed upon it. Sometimes by even its juxtaposition in a frame of reference, if you know anything about art, the artists are very aware of a lot of the aspects about how color is affected by context and play with that. Things that strengthen in moderation will weaken when taken in an excess. Food strengthens until you eat too much. Then you're weighed down, you grow sleepy and wine that can make you stimulated or put you to sleep. So look at A and B, which is darker, which is lighter. I'm not talking about the letters, I'm talking about the squares. Do you have an opinion? You think you're being fooled, don't you? You think I'm playing a game, tricking you. So, some of you probably said it's a trick. They're not the diff they're not different color they're not different shades, right? But others of you believed your senses and you said, "Nah, A is darker than B." You went with your senses. I'd say the first group was probably dogmatic. You're not going to be tricked. You're dogmatically going to adhere to a belief which is not supported by anything you see simply because you believe Bob is fooling with you. So much for seeing is believing. You reached opposite conclusions about whether A and B had the same shade, depending on which image you saw. If you did not reach an opposite conclusions and you knew the answer and dogmatically stuck to your original belief. I'm sorry, it's worse than that. You see the intensity of light and the shadow in the two pictures are different. The shadow in the second picture is sufficient to make the shade of B match A's. See, look at that. Now look, at, look particularly at the cylinder. Now look at this cylinder. Now look at this cylinder. So the shadow, the intensity of light in this image is greater than the intensity of light in this image or the shadow is correspondingly darker.
bias even has an effect on what we see. We have expectations. So to wrap up on the, the skeptics, the point about the skeptics is they wanted to avoid dogma. They found that there was, uh, these questions went on forever. There was no ultimate answer in them. It causes a lot of distress. It's all right to, uh, to make assumptions and try them out pragmatically, see how they work, but to uh, step into dogma, to, to unquestioning belief uh, can lead not only to error, it can lead to a lot of stress. And so they were trying to seek peace by uh, equipoise. We won't over uh, commit to this point or its opposite. So I think each of these four schools have something to offer. Uh, the uh, cynics are saying, society, wake up, uh, know who you are, question your conventions. Maybe some of the things you believe uh, are uh, merely, con merely conventions, not necessary, and your over uh, commitment to them is more a habit and a desire to belong rather than to, to live a better life. And uh, the uh, uh, sophists, not the sophists, but the um, uh, having my mental, mo my senior moment here, my the the uh, Stoics are trying to help us uh, deal with the um, place we have in life. Be rational in understanding the nature of your reality and conform to it. Don't tr don't fight what you cannot change, and you'll be happy. The skeptics are saying, here are the, some of the dangers of dogma and here a way out of it. And the Epicureans uh, say that the real life of uh, pleasure lies in avoidance of pain and the, the uh, middle way between ex excess. Yes, uh, food and drink are good, but don't take them to excess. And that's why I said in the announcement of this class that the, this, these teachings of these four schools come down to the present day and you find them in everyday um, self-help uh, teachings. So if you think philosophy is a trifling affair, consider what uh, Giovanni Pico di Della Mirandola uh, said in the oration on the dignity of man. These are the reasons why I decided to study philosophy, but I'm not going to explain them to anyone except those who condemn philosophy. People are beginning to think wrongly in that philosophy should be studied only by very few, if at all, as if it was something of little worth. We reduce philosophy to only being useful when being used for, for profit. That was what was the sophists were accused of, by the way. I say these things with regret and indignation, for the philosophers who say it should not be pursued because it is of no value. Thus disqualify, the philosophers who say it, it should not be pursued because it has no value, are thus disqualified themselves as philosophers. Since they are in it for their own personal gain, they miss the truth for its own sake. I'm going to say not to brag, but I've never philosophized except for the sake of philosophy, and have never desired it for my own cultivation. cultivation. And by that he means gain, I think, except uh, to speak the truth, to speak honorably. And this is from Bertrand Russell, a uh, great mathematician and philosopher. Many men and under the influence of science or practical affairs are inclined to doubt whether philosophy is anything better than innocent, uh, an innocent, useless trifling, hair-splitting distinctions and controversies on matters concerning which knowledge is impossible. Um, this view of philosophy appears to result partly from a wrong conception of the ends of life partly from a wrong conception of the kinds of goods which philosophy strives to achieve. 
If the study of philosophy has any value for others than students of philosophy, it must be only indirectly through its effects upon the lives of those who study it. The value of philosophy is, in fact, to be sought largely in the very uncertainty. Philosophy, though unable to tell us with certainty what is the true answer to the doubts which it raises, is able to suggest possibilities. And uh, Richard Feynman, and many of you probably know of him, um, great uh, physicist of the 20th century, American. I live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in a mysterious universe without any purpose, which is the way it really looks as far as I can tell. It really is as far as I can tell. So philosophy, the point of philosophy is simply to open up the imagination to possibilities by critical thought. And these philosophers were all doing that. You might consider their, their schools of philosophy as experiments. Uh, and uh, next time, we will be talking about Aristotle, who took an entirely different turn. He really wanted to synthesize everything that was known at the time. He's the father, father of the physician who was the doctor to Philip of Macedon. And uh, so he grew up wealthy. Uh, uh, his father being a doctor, he grew up under the influence of what was then science in the ancient world. Um, but he's a very different kind of philosopher than these four that we studied today. Time for questions. Well, the mic's going out. Here's, a, here's a Massimo Piliucci's uh, article in the New York Times, <clears throat> 2015, How to Be a Stoic. And here's one I copied yesterday, Epicurus, Tranquility and Free Will. So the, the, these philosophers are still being uh, discussed even today. Okay. Hi, Bob. This is Joan. Um, I have a question about Epicureans. But first, I must thank you. I, you've obviously put an incredible amount of work into this. And I thank you very much for that. You're welcome. It's worthwhile. Um, the, I think you said the Epicureans believed that no human is inherently superior to another right. and none should dominate another. Is that the uh, usual kind of thing where they don't really mean women and slaves? They mean yeah. men like themselves? <laughs> I'm tempted to say, oh, well, we were really only talking about men. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I, as I recall, Epicurus was, uh, there were w women in that school, Epicurean school. Uh, it wasn't, though uh, ancient Greece was definitely patriarchal, uh, it wasn't uniformly so. There, were, uh, there was questioning of that going on, and I don't think it would be consistent with Epicurus materialism to assert, because he would make no distinction between the materiality of a male as opposed to a female. That's what, where this conviction comes from, we're all equal. It comes from uh, atomism. So I, I don't believe it was about men only. Same thing, slaves, yeah. They could be dominated, yeah, by, but it's, uh, it has to do with worth, inherent worth. I think the Epicureans would say that's a convention of society, that we have slaves as a convention of society. It's not intrinsically true. Bob, thank you, too. I want to add to what Joan said. Oh. <clears throat> you made us think today. Personally, I'm exhausted. I, it's been I, a, it's I been invited you to adventure. think. I hope I didn't make you think. <laughs> anyway, this brings back a lot of memories from <clears throat> some earlier studies and the allegory of the cave, you know, and right. pursuit of what is reality from the different yep. points of view, uh, whether or not, you know, we're, that, that reality is per per perfection and we're living in this fake right. That's world. Uh, and our, our goal is to pursue the essence of reality, which is perfection. Anyway, the, the reason there's, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, my question is, I've got to, yeah, my throat's gone. Uh, my question is, what is going on today in the realm of new knowledge to explore the same questions? You know, we have a lot of knowledge base that they didn't have that has to influence those questions. Right. And it, it, yes, it, that's true. Yeah. And uh, what was going on this morning is part of what's going on today. And uh, uh, neuroscience is uh, teaching us so much. Evolutionary biology is teaching us so, so much about uh, why we think the way we do. Uh, the, 
the, the speculative philosophy that uh, was in Greece has branched out into a variety of fields, many fields that are uh, scientific now and, and very productive of new knowledge. But there are still people in the background who say, okay, well, what does that mean? Look at, or thinking about tying the points together, seeing, thinking about what the implications are relative to our values, our form of society. I, for one, I'll say it right now, uh, really have some very deep doubts about um, the model of uh, democracy that uh, the founders created because it was premised on some assumptions that are now highly questionable. The rationality of human beings. If we, are, if we live with bias, deep bias, it's very hard to overcome uh, alone. Shouldn't we be thinking about institutions, ways of uh, revealing that bias and giving us an opportunity to limit it? That we heard about bias this morning. So philosophers would stop and do that. They would say, okay, what about the um, 18th century model of uh, a representative democracy and the rational man, the rational, <laughs> there's a Nobel laureate in ec economics, I think he's partnered with somebody else, who's questioned the rational man concept in, um, in uh, uh, free market economies because the free market economy model was based upon the idea that humans are rational and they would make rational choices, but we have biases which means we make bad choices con uh, in a consistent way in some ways, some of the time. And then, so you have to change your model and philosophers will do that. Um, so uh, philosophy is going on, has new things to work on, but. And the other thing is, I th think what, he w that, uh, that what is going on in various fields now is partly philosophical. These uh, theoretical physicists sometimes are acting like philosophers. They're, that is to say they're speculating, they're model, model building, and then they say, okay, now let's put it on the chalkboard and work out the formulas. How do you express this? Or in um, uh, using your imagination speculatively to question certain assumptions, let's say, in human psychology. That originally was a philosophical endeavor. It's been borrowed and incorporated into processes that are outside of academic philosophy. But I think philosophy in the street is still useful for everyone. Doesn't it help to be re reflective once in a while in a systematic way? And doesn't it help to borrow somebody who can, you can resonate with and say, oh, I think this guy's got something to say. I find that not just true of reading about philosophers, but poets and writers especially often give me new things to think about. I'm, uh, when it comes to human beings, I'm particularly impressed by writers' ability to understand us. And uh, so I, I become reflective about that. We were, just one more thing. We, we, our book club was yesterday talking about um, How to Be a Better Creature by Cy Montgomery, good book. And she went, the, the, the mind or the soul of an octopus was her first big seller. And so one of the issues that came up that our group was talking about was, was she being too anthropomorphic in the way she was relating to these animals? And, my feeling initially was, yes, she was. I said that to my wife. But by the time I got to the book club, I said, what else is she going to do? <laughs> She's a human being. You can do it consciously or unconsciously, but you're gonna, in the end, you're going to use human ways of thinking about the animal. You cannot get into their brains. But doesn't that make, give you an, a, con a connection, a way of creating a, a, a connection with the animal? And in fact, she did establish co uh, connections with e of a kind with even the... Uh, uh, the tarantula down in um, French Guiana. She used her her modeling, her way of thinking, as a way of making connections. All right. Hi, Bob. Sylvie. Yeah. Um, I have a trouble with what seems to be put out as the goal of Stoicism as happiness. To me, happiness is a really a, is a kind of a superficial term. It, it would seem like you would... Like love. I just love McDonald's French French fries. They make you happy, right? <laughs> it makes me happy. <laughs> well, you're probably kicking sand in my face then, but I'm I'm just thinking it's, it's would be a this the Buddhist philosophy that your goal is to attain acceptance and calm um, and serenity. All of those seem words that are conditions that are that are attainable. It seems like happiness is transitory, just like. McDonald's hamburgers are. You're done with that and 
So, I mean, is there is there a point there? Well, just the choice the, of the, the word? meaning the meanings of words are conventional. It's what we agree the meanings will have. These philosophers are advocating for certain states of mind and emotion that they think are worthy of pursuing. And <clears throat> transitoriness is a problem. They're clearly seeking something that will be, will last. Tranquility, peace of mind, their, 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 their goal there is that it be lasting through thick and thin, through better or worse. And the way you do that is by detachment in the case of uh, uh, stoicism and skepticism, a kind of detachment. Just say, look, these are things I cannot change. Therefore, I'm going to be happy whatever happens. Not, hap not happy in the sense of ha ha ha, but happy in the sense of peaceful, implacable. Um, what's the other word? Uh, Content, yeah. Yeah, those. Yeah. But I guess you, if you want to anthropomorphize something, you could think, well, otters playing are certainly happy. Yes. Little children, little toddlers playing are happy. There's, they've, they've nothing to accept because they're in, in them now. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, uh, they're in the moment. They're not asking the moment to be any more than it is. Otters and kids. Uh, and w when the kid cries, they want the, they want the moment to be different than it is. Uh, I haven't witnessed an otter crying, but uh, I have to be an otter in the next life if there's any justice. I want to be an otter, it's true. <laughs> Uh, because uh, to live, <laughs> to live the way they live, it may be a short life, but what a what a great one. <laughs> um, hi, this is Joan. I just have a response to Solve. Um, I, I think the concept of happiness, for the Greek philosophers at least, was very different, and so for reasons that completely escaped me, I memorized Aristotle's definition of happiness from the Nicomachean Ethics when I was a sophomore in college. It's like the only thing I remember, but it's happiness is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. And if there is more than one virtue in accordance with the highest and best, and this over a whole lifetime, for one swallow does not make the summer, nor does one day. And that's a big deal, that's much different from. That's impressive. We're going to move your A up to an A plus for remembering all these years. <laughs> yeah, I, I recently read the Nicomachean Ethics with a friend, and uh, um, it's worth reading. Uh, oh, here. Steve, who? A porpoise is on my short list. <laughs> I'd rather be a porpoise. Okay. <laughs> okay, a simple question. Um, why do we call it a Pyrrhic victory? Uh, that is named after another person, and uh, the person's name was, uh, I don't remember, it was a Roman, I believe. And it had to do with the fact that it was the 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 goal the, what they wanted was destroyed in the in the success of the battle. And by the way, there are two of those. There, there's a Pyrrhic victory, and there's another name of another Roman at another battle. It means exactly the same thing. I'll look it up for you. But I discovered this a long time ago. But it's named after the Roman general. Thank you. You're very thorough. No, no, Pyrrhus was a Greek, and he fought the Romans. Was it okay? He lost so many men. I said it was a Roman battle, but it was, I had the wrong general. He lost so many men in the battle that when you win a battle but lose most of your men, it's a Pyrrhic victory. Okay. And the, there's, a, there's a similar story in, Ro, in a Roman battle where they basically lost too much. That, that was, to call it a success, a victory. I discovered that those within months of each other back a long time ago, but yeah. Anything else? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.